Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? I just got another retro ThinkPad to add to my collection. I, I guess I'm collecting these now, but this one's got a cool little trick up its sleeve. So let's just get to the point since I kinda gave it away in the thumbnail anyway. This is an IBM ThinkPad 760ED from right around 1996. It's a pretty straightforward business-oriented laptop, but there's one nifty trick that I honestly wasn't expecting this machine to do. Yeah, when you open the screen, the keyboard tilts up in the back. This is the kind of thing that I just never really would have expected IBM to put in a laptop, right? We're all so used to IBM being very business oriented, right? Like it's in the name and very kind of staunch and not really much having fun or anything like that. But yeah, they go and do clever things like this. Now, if you don't want the keyboard lifted up, you can just take these little levers and flip it back down. And if you want it to stay down all the time so that that function doesn't really work, there's a couple of latches here. You can just push them back and that'll lock the keyboard in place. But it's a clever little mechanism. These latches ride in channels on either side of the screen housing. And so there's no like electronics or anything involved in tilting this. It's just a very simple but clever mechanical design. So yeah, that's really kind of the gist of this one. It's an otherwise pretty typical business laptop that happens to have a clever trick keyboard. No, it's not quite as cool as the butterfly keyboard on like the ThinkPad 701C, but uh, you know, I could see this thing actually benefiting some people if you've got a lot of typing to do. Anyway, uh, thanks for watching. Okay, now that all the impatient people are probably bailed out by now, this thing actually has another really cool trick that we'll get to in just a second. So it probably comes as no surprise that a machine of this age, the rubber like coating on the outside and the palm rest here, it's just turned sticky and ugh. I mean, the stickiness I can kind of get over what sucks is like all the dust and everything gets stuck to it too. And I like just scrubbed this because everyone complains if I show something dirty or dusty on camera and you just can't get all of the dust and stuff off. It's just permanently stuck. It's horrible. Anyway, uh, stereo speakers on the front corners, which is kind of a neat thing. I don't know if it's on any other models of ThinkPads, but check this out. Left and right pointer buttons. You can lock them down. Like, I'm guessing that's just to make it easier if you need to like click and drag. So you're not having to, you know, hold it down while you do it or whatever. I don't know. Uh, have you ever seen this functionality on other machines with, with track point nubs? Uh, this is kind of clever, actually. There's a built-in CD-ROM drive up front. This is actually a modular bay. We'll talk about um, some of the limitations of this bay in just a second. And then if we turn the machine around, on the right side, we've got a pair of PC card slots, and apparently these are card bus enabled, plus a PS2 port. They've got the mouse labeled on here, although I suspect it would work fine with a keyboard too. Then on the back, a pretty typical selection of ThinkPad ports. You've got DC power input, of course, serial, parallel, VGA. This big guy is the docking port connector, and what's kind of neat is if you have the external dock, for this, you don't even need to flip the door down. You can slide this panel over just to expose the docking connector. This is the port for plugging in the external floppy drive module if you have one. And then this, this is a port that's kind of weird. It only made sense when I read the marking on the door. This is actually for external MIDI devices or joysticks. It's like a joystick port, but just small form factor. There's also an infrared port on the back for IRDA. That's for like synchronizing with PDAs and stuff. And one thing I forgot to mention is around front, there's actually another infrared port up here as well. So they were all in on the IR communication for this model. 
And finally on the left side, we've got power switch, of course, headphone and microphone jacks. There's a built-in 28.8 fax data modem, which is kind of neat, at least for the time period. And then these two ports are one of the most interesting things I've seen on a laptop in a while. This is for NTSC composite video in and out. They're non-standard connectors. I've never seen these before. They look like they're little three pin connectors. You'd obviously need some sort of external dongle to use them, but they allow you to capture composite video into the machine or output composite video. Now outputting composite video would make sense if you're trying to do like a presentation. Remember this is 1996. So sometimes you just had to like hook up to a TV. And so being able to run your PowerPoint or whatever through a cable to the TV, you know, when you're in the boardroom or whatever, that makes a lot of sense. The video capture is kind of curious. And apparently this machine also has built-in MPEG-2 decoding or acceleration or something along those lines. So you could actually embed videos within your presentations and they'd play smoothly because the CPU itself wouldn't be the bottleneck. It wouldn't be doing software decoding. That's pretty crazy for 1996 in a laptop. So the rubberized coating on the top is actually in a lot better shape than on the palm rest. The palm rest is the worst for the stickiness. This is just starting to get a little bit grippy. But one thing that I noticed when I was wiping this down is this coating actually has a blue like metallic flake to it. I'd never seen that before on a ThinkPad. You would look at this thing, you know, from a distance and go, well, it's just matte black, probably that rubbery coating. But when the light hits it just right, it actually sparkles. It looks really cool. So, of course, one of the first things that I do whenever I get a new machine, at least new to me machine, is I like to wipe the hard drive and reinstall the OS. Now, unfortunately, I never got the external floppy drive with this machine. I have other external floppy drives for other laptops, but they don't have the same connector as that one on the back. This machine shipped with Windows 95 and my plan was to install 98. I figured it'd be kind of a nice upgrade anyway, but you need to boot either of those off of a floppy disk in order to get the optical drive working. Well, here's where I'm at. I need to take the hard drive out of this. I figure it's just gonna be fastest and easiest if I take the existing drive out and drop it in like another laptop that has a floppy and optical drive, I can wipe the hard drive from there, copy all the Windows files over. In fact, I did a video all about doing kind of a faster way of installing like Windows 95, 98, instead of running it directly off the CD and copy the files to the hard drive first. So I figure I'll just copy all the files over and then run the install from this machine's own hard drive you know, that's been made bootable with DOS from another computer. So how do I get the hard drive out of this machine? So I start looking around for like access panels and stuff, because usually it's a, you know, a hatch on the bottom of the machine or whatever, right? Well, I looked all around and the only access panel I can find is this one. And this one's kind of hard drive sized, so, you know, we can unlatch it and it comes off pretty easily, but when you, uh, you take it out and then you see what's going on with this thing. Yeah, this is actually the RAM card. <laughs> That's pretty neat. I like how easily upgradable this RAM is. This particular version came with 16 megabytes on board of this daughter card. And then there's obviously an additional upgrade SIM installed in here. So you can see the built-in RAM underneath, and then this one is another 16 meg module. So this machine has 32 megs of RAM, um, which I think is a really good amount for this machine. Otherwise, it's a Pentium 133 megahertz. So this thing was really no slouch for when it was new. But still, that leaves the question, how do you get at the hard drive in this thing? Maybe it's some sort of like, you've got to disassemble it or whatever? No. This is the other really cool trick that having that flip up keyboard makes really easy. So you open the display and then you push the display further back. This machine, the screen actually opens a full 180 degrees, which for this time period was fairly uncommon in and of itself. 
you flip the keyboard back down so it's not tilted. And then the same two latches on the sides you use to unlatch the screen, you actually push them backwards, and the whole keyboard assembly flips up like the hood on a car. And it'll just stay up like that so you can access the inside. So yeah, no tools needed to get at any of this stuff. It all comes out, it's completely modular. The optical drive on the left side here, it's a four times unit. If you just pick up on these tabs, it'll disconnect from the back and then I have to be careful because this is actually a decent amount of ballast to hold the front down, but the entire module comes out. And then if you wanted, you could swap in a floppy drive and there'd be an appropriate cover for the front, you know, to blank it off. Or you could actually blank off the entire front, flip this blue latch up. What are those? Those are battery contacts. This machine can actually support two batteries at the same time. So you can drop a second battery in here and it'll go from one to the other as they discharge. Here's the primary battery. It just lifts straight out. And I'm pretty sure it was the same module to go in on this side because it's like the same size and just generally fits. You'd put a cover in the front. And then the hard drive is over here. They give you a couple of pull tabs for that. And it just pops up and lifts out off of a kind of a quick disconnect thing. So I'm just going to take this drive and pull it out and drop it in another machine and get the files copied over to it. All right, see if I can get the drive disconnected from this ribbon, this flat flex thing without having to deal with all this like nut and bolt malarkey going on that's holding it there. A little bit of gentle. Yeah, there we go. So I just looked this drive up and I don't think it's original to this machine because according to the model number, it's actually a four gigabyte drive. All the information that I've found about this particular ThinkPad model, it only shipped with like your choice of a one gigabyte or at the high end, a two gigabyte drive. So it looks like not just the RAM in the computer was upgraded, but at some point, somebody swapped the hard drive too. So if you think the angled keyboard is kind of quirky for an IBM product, this is just downright whimsical. The whole flappy bird pointer. Check this out. Like, obviously it's freaking out because the clock battery is bad and I need to, you know, buy one and, and all that. But you move, <laughs> you move the pointer around and it's a bird flapping its wings. I know this is on a few other models, but it just like... IBM is just so straight laced. Who approved that? Like, you can't have fun with IBM products except, all right, fine, when you get to the error screen, we'll let the duck start flapping around. <laughs> and then, yeah, it's, you know, freaking out about the time and date and whatever. We'll just pretend it's still 96. That's fine. Can I get into the cool setup? This thing actually also has a really cool BIOS setup. You hold down F1. Yeah, so it's got this like visual BIOS thing called Easy Setup, which is pretty neat. You got the old Flappy Bird pointer around here too. And you can just like the point, you know, the, obviously the pointer works and stuff and you can go into settings and everything. This is kind of neat when you go into config mode, the pointer turns into a screwdriver. Like you've also got built in self tests, which is kind of neat. So if you're suspecting a piece of hardware isn't working correctly, it can do its own self tests. So here's what I mean about the whole boot up thing. So we go into the startup options and like, if you want to change the order of them, it's drag and drop. Like this is wild, but you can see the default order, you know, floppy drive, hard drive, and, and all this combination of factors. CD-ROM is not one of them. And that really sucks, especially when you don't have the floppy drive, either module or external for this thing. Now, what is interesting is you can supposedly boot from PCMCIA. However, that only seems to work with bus adapter types of cards. And in fact, this machine came conveniently enough with this SCSI PC card. Unfortunately, it's missing the dongle, so I can't really use it. I'll have to maybe I track one of those down. But it won't work out of the PC card with like a compact flash adapter. 
or anything like that. I tried off camera. It just didn't detect it at all. But again, I'm just really kind of impressed by this whole user interface. Um, that they bothered to go to this level instead of just the basic text mode type of BIOS. It shows a decent amount of attention to detail. I changed my mind and ended up putting Windows 95 on here, mostly because I kind of realized I don't have any laptops that are running 95. I just kind of default to 98. I've always thought 98 was a bit better. So why not? It is period accurate for this machine. It's what it originally shipped with. This computer does have, even though it's got the upgraded RAM and the hard drive got swapped out, it does have the default LCD panel. It's a 12 inch TFT, 800 by 600. Though there was an XG8 or 1024 by 768 version available as well. I was able to find this cool IBM battery utility and you can see it knows that there's the capability of having two batteries in this unit. Obviously the second one would show up if you had the battery installed in there. And then it's also what lets you like switch between the two and check the state of charge and all that kind of stuff. It's kind of neat. And here's what I was talking about with that whole video in out kind of stuff. So we've got an entry and device manager here for the ThinkPad M-Wave DSP digital signal processor. You can see we've also got some options in here for like MPEG PCI bridge. So this thing definitely has built in hardware MPEG acceleration of some sort. Unfortunately, I don't have any software that I can use to really test this well because I can't find original restore disks for this machine. It didn't come with a restore partition or any of the accessories. So this is just a vanilla Windows 95 install with whatever drivers I was able to find on the internet. Hopefully I can find some cool software that we can use at a later time to show off what this thing's capable of. But otherwise, that's it for this machine, ThinkPad 760ED. These apparently cost quite a bit back when they were new. Some research suggests that the base models of these were somewhere around $3,500 to $4,000 US, and a machine configured like this was about 6,000 bucks. They were highly rated in reviews from back when they were new, but yeah, you definitely had to pay a lot to get the performance that this thing offered. Would I recommend you go out and get one of these now if the specs or whatever are interesting to you? Yes and no. If you're a collector of ThinkPads, I think you probably should have one just because of the, the whole trick keyboard thing. That was pretty unique. Maybe not necessarily the ED series specifically, but a 760 of some sort. But otherwise, if you're just looking for a Pentium laptop, there were a lot of other good models out during that same time. And while I think this is a good one, the downsides of the whole, you need an external floppy to boot so you can reinstall the OS from the internal CD, the internal CD not being bootable on its own, that sort of thing, It's that's a little messy. There were a lot of other machines that had both floppy and CD built in at the same time, and that makes life quite a bit easier. But if you're a ThinkPad enthusiast and you like the retro machines, well, if you come across one, that's a good deal. Hey, why not? Anyway, if you like this one, I would appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on social media at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.